So we're about to listen to a conversation between artist Grada Quilomba and Castello di Rivoli Museum Director Carolyn Christoph Bakarjiv. Grada Quilomba is an artist and writer living in Berlin. Her work draws on memory, trauma, and post-colonialism. Quilomba is best known for her subversive writing and her unique practice of storytelling, in which she brings her own writing into performance, image, and installation. Her work has been presented at the 10th Berlin Biennale in 2018, Documenta 14 in Kassel 2017, and the 32nd San Paolo Biennale in 2016. Many thanks, Grada, for being here with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Hello. Uh, hello, Grada. It's wonderful to, to be able to speak to you. <laughs> now, it looks like we're in the same place because you are also using a backdrop from the uh, Castello di Rivoli walls, which are painted. This is not a digital construction, but it's, a, it's an image of the wall painting by um, Claudia Conte. Uh, and one of the reasons we used backdrops, Grada, for this event was actually coming from the preparatory conversation with you some days ago when you, um, we were talking about a, digit, a new epistemic regime of the digital where somehow biopolitics had gone much further than when, let's say, Foucault was writing uh, and into a particular also realm of the private space of the person who's always on the Zoom. Uh, and although we heard an ironic comment about complaining about this in the video, uh, in the, in the um, performative, let's say, intervention uh, by Hito uh, previous to your presentation, I'm not sure you, you saw that, I still would like to bring up this subject of what it means to be on all these Zoom conversations with your house or your bedroom or your kitchen in, in, the, in the public realm. Yeah. Um, first, hello, Caroline. It's wonderful to be here in the conversation. And it's also, uh, we had a short conversation before and I told you, I don't want to do these conversations anymore. I think they are a contradiction to the uh, lockdown. And uh, since, since we entered this year of 2020 uh, with the corona and the lockdown and the distance, um, I think I always thought these conversations come in such a, a immensity, they are so many that we are most of the times invite, we could be on conversations online every single day. I realized that I had to make a very clear border to say no to most of the conversations because you are supposed to be available all the time. You are available to the digital world. And you are not only available to the digital world because you don't have to travel so everybody can say it's just one hour and you can be part of it and then you are ready. But the this, 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 uh, these conversations enter a very private sphere where we are having the conversations in our private, because of the lockdown, in our very private spaces. So you, you see bedrooms behind us and, and living rooms and kitchens. The children come inside. I just had to prepare a very good setting with a very good film and to make sure, and with the pizza, to make sure that my children don't enter the space and interfere. So this, this idea of the privacy, um, I think is something that is one of the topics that scares me most for the new generation, that they might not know uh, what privacy is, what belongs to them and what belongs to the public uh, eye. And I think um, this is something we started our conversation with um, and to have this digital, this digital background that protects us a little bit from um, protect, 
put us in the public eye, but protect us from uh, showing our privacy. You accepted not to use an image that you would choose of your own work as a background, for example, mm. or, or one offered by Zoom or something, but you welcomed that we would put the background of the museum wall behind mm. you now, which is, I find interesting because it puts us in, a, at least in a digital conversation, in some virtual space that's actually same room. Mm, mm. somehow. So I found that a very interesting reversal of the reversal of what you said a moment ago, it, in, in a very, another kind of privacy, mm. at least on a level of uh, what um, was spoken about, a kind of um, performing the analog that occurs in museums somehow. Uh, another question that is important I think, and that has not been spoken about and that does cause uh, at least economic stress, if not also a form of trauma, is the question, well, there's two, uh, 1A and 1B. 1A being the question of the cost of all of this. I mean, there are a lot of people producing content and they are not often paid there's often no fee, you know, oh, you just need half an hour at your home. So uh, you are not paid. While when you go to give a lecture, you, you take a plane, the hotel and the fee. So um, it was important for us to find the money for some fees in this case. Uh, mm -hmm. But I still believe that there's hundreds of thousands of content producers that are um, in a situation of unregulated labor, a little bit like cottage industry at the beginning of the industrial revolution. So uh, I am not a Luddite, but I do think that we are uh, in a moment where the reforms that are necessary uh, to mitigate things like the introduction of the eight hour work day uh, it was only introduced after people were working for 14 or 18 hours a day in the mm. factories. And so all of these corrections or mitigations or norms or legislation around um, the digital production has to be done. And what I've seen is the GDPR being wiped out during COVID. Basically, the GDPR, which was a, a European norm because I speak with my situated knowledge and my background, I cannot speak for, for everyone. But at least here, there was an attempt to, con to, to control the, um, the big data grab uh, and with the GDPR and it seems to have been wiped out uh, completely. So that's kind of one A, I wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts about the question of this labor within the, this alienated labor. And one B was about the language, the question of speech and language with colonialism was a big issue. The disparis, the disparizione, the disappearing of so many languages uh, in Africa, for example, and now there is another maybe form that people who are living in the um, English sphere are not aware of that it also has an extra cost. I mean, our, and so we decided to use the Google Translate for this conference from English to Italian. And it's rather experimental because it's both a transcription software combined with a translation software so mm -hmm. it's like the subtitling for accessibility of CNN, also put through a software for translation and combined. So it is rather catastrophic. We are getting messages that it is rather catastrophic to the Italians who have stopped reading the Google translation and are listening through their broken English to this conference. So 
I just wanted to bring these subjects that are spaces of contention that are not usually spoken about. Hmm. Well, I don't know if I can say much about that. I can say a lot about what concerns me or my work, what I am busy with. I think uh, um, when we spoke about, um, about this conversation um, and what you have mentioned now, what I am very busy to reflect and it became very prominent this year, which is a accumulation of many years of work and it, it became so visible, is that one of the main topics of my work is trauma. And trauma, the word trauma is in the very title of this conference, digital virtual conference. And I, I think it is important for me then to maybe to talk how I connect with these words and how I connect uh, these to the topic maybe. And maybe that answers your question A and B, I am not sure. Um, but trauma has been uh, the very center of, of the works I've been doing in the last uh, 15, actually 20 years. I've been working, starting with writing mostly and staging, and the work has changed constantly. But the question of trauma, I've been very busy with and uh, with what uh, it derives from. It derives from the Greek word for wound um, and for pain, for piercing, for uh, bleeding. And that uh, is a word trauma that has been very rarely used in relation to uh, colonialism and to uh, cyclical violence and to racism today. So uh, I was very concerned in my work to link something that is so violent and so brutal um, with the word uh, trauma. Um, and this is what I, I, I started and have been working with to understand what the colonial trauma is and how this colonial trauma is repeated and restaged today in today's racism. And this year in particular was a year, was a very difficult year for all of us and for most of us, and, but especially for the black communities. It was a very painful year uh, because the violence of racism became so visible and became this continuity of this wound became so visible um, and became also visible through um, the tools of, uh, of the digital, of, of video and Im digital image. We had access to police brutality and uh, to, the, to, um, to violence through the exactly through uh, these digital images that otherwise would be hidden. And this is, I think it's so, um, so th this is very much what is here worse for me when I link the title that you presented with trauma and, uh, and the digital era, this is how I connect. Trauma is, is a very complex, uh, is, is a very, very, very complex, um, a concept, um, but mostly trauma, this wound speaks about the something that is experienced that is so violent that it cannot be organized psychologically. It is something that is so violent that we actually, as human beings, do not have neither the language nor the words to apply meaning to. This is what trauma is. Uh, it's something, it's a concept that we could look at it in three, uh, in three um, moments. The first moment is this violent shock. There is a violent shock um, that something is experienced, not because it's not expected, like cyclical violence is expected or uh, racism is expected, but the violence is not this an 
an expectation, but rather the violence resides in the fact that uh, dehumanizes you. And is, it's something that places you outside humanity. Uh, and this is, um, this is the very first moment of trauma. This violence that dehumanizes you um, comes to a second moment. And this second moment means uh, fragmentation and separation. This moment of experience, this dehumanization separates you and fragments you from the rest of society. And this is, comes to the third moment, which is something, a sense of timelessness. Then suddenly the present um, is experienced as to coincide with the past. The past is experienced as if we, um, as, as present, and the present is experienced as past. And this sense of timelessness um, is part of this trauma, of this colonial wound that is restaged in everyday life. And this is for me what was my connection with the title. How do I uh, work th that in, in my works, and how this was so. Um, visible this here with this corona crisis that actually exposed 500 years of, um, of, of colonial violence and of, 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 uh, of a dynamic that has been perpetuated and restaged again and again. So um, coming from what you said from uh, question A to question B or one to two, um, this is how I connect to uh, what you uh, were mentioning. Thank you. So from what you said now, uh, the experience of the digital is actually a contribution to emancipation because it makes visible what was not visible before. But how do you then deal with questions like Timnit Gibru being uh, licenciato, uh, being fired from Google because she was writing a paper about, uh, you know, about um, bias, bias and racist also bias in artificial intelligence, in large language models. Mm -hmm. And so within, obviously, then, in Google translations, by consequence. Yes, absolutely. But that is also shows this uh, complexity of of uh, of each tool that we have in front of us, and the dangers, and the possibilities, and the dangers. I remember uh, it was some days ago when we were talking, and we spoke about film and about how film, like all the disciplines, like literature, like painting, like uh, all the disciplines, uh, from philosophy to psychology to anthropology, uh, all the disciplines um, were creating, created the theory of the inferior, the theory of colonialism. They were there to guarantee that there are humans and subhumans. They were there to develop not only a discourse and a language, but also a imagery that makes sure that identities are in hierarchy and that certain identities can represent the human conditions and others cannot. So, and how film uh, was so important to create these racist and colonial um, the schools for a very simple reason because racism is not biological, racism is discursive. It, it functions through the schools, that means it functions through an association of words and of images. So, image and film was extremely important to create um, a colonial discourse, the discourse of infuriation, the discourse of racism. And we were talking, I am in Berlin, I'm based in Berlin, and um, I, I, I was very much involved with uh, the black, in the black community. Um, and 
researching and looking back at film was extremely important to see that, for instance, during the National Socialism, um, where uh, this horrible tragedy was happening and people, people of color, racialized people were being taken to concentration camps. Something that was happening uh, was that Afro-Germans and, and the black population in Germany um, were not taken to the concentration camps or were taken from the concentration camps and, and put apart ex exactly to be used as extras to the film industry because the interests of the Germans were to, uh, to, re uh, to, to uh, recover the, the colonial empire and, uh, and the film played a very important role. So um, I was then working and in contact and interviewing uh, very uh, uh, Afro-German actors who survived that area, that time, and that they were saved extra to, um, to, 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 to work as extras in, in the film. So, this is what the film industry contributed to. They were, I think also the name of extras is so, um, is so uh, meaningful because it's, uh, it's, it's, a story, it's those films that were um, supposed to be, to, to tell the history of Africa. And uh, it's this most uh, perverse moment of being, placed as extra, as invisible in your own geography and yeah. in your own storytelling. So, and then we talked about one of the things that I, I, I then did with a, a world of illusions and a trilogy where these black uh, actors are in this white space is exactly to leave that, bring the extras to the front to tell the story and to have this white space and to, disrupt this white space. Yes, maybe, maybe it's a moment to um, specify that uh, you're, when I saw your work first, mm -hmm. uh, I saw the first part of something called a world of illusion, mm -hmm. of illusions, and it was 2019. And this trilogy is dedicated to, well, it, it retransforms uh, the stories of Narcissus and Echo uh, Oedipus and Antigone, the, the question of the burial of the brother in Antigone. So uh, this becomes a performative video in which now we were about to talk about. And uh, it is also in the form of installations in spaces. Mm -hmm. So the visitors see the films projected and the best situation is with the three on three sides of a triangle. So you are uh, in, a, let's call it an analog space, uh, a, mm -hmm. a space of, a, of an exhibition and viewing, however, this white space, which is this, you know, whitewashed space, mm -hmm. this absent background. And this is also, again, the question of the background, which we were talking about a moment ago yeah. in the digital, uh, the, the attempt to push the background, which is so-called real, to give an illusion of real, we're going into the house of some, or the studio of some artist, you know, a privilege mm -hmm. for that an art Basel or something might do uh, to go into the studio of the artist. So I, can you continue? Um, you were about to speak, but I just wanted to tell what was this um, mm -hmm. uh, trilogy that you spoke about. And in particular, Narcissus, this reversal of, of the Narcissus or how you use the story of this narcissistic uh, colonial power and mm. uh, the fact that there continues to be um, in the world this position is almost a narcissistic disorder. And it's a very interesting fact that we live in the era of the selfie also, which mm. is almost like being in a suspended uh, mirror stage that we, the European or the colonial can not get out of the mirror stage. Hmm. I don't I, know if I, I explained myself. You did very well. And, and I, I think, I think um, 
I think what fascinates me in working with is a mythology that is delivered to us as universal and which is a beautiful mythology because it talks about human tragedies is really to see the continuity uh, of violence, how this violence is restaged and how these very human tragedies um, can be looked at and read from depending from different perspectives, you can discover and you can unveil uh, so much complexity. So um, when I talk of uh, restaging these three myths, the first one was for the Biennale of Sao Paulo in 2016. Uh, it was Narcissus and Echo. I wanted to use the story of Narcissus uh, to, um, to think, to reflect upon the politics of misrepresentation and invisibility. And I'm saying that to remember what I said at the beginning about this wound, this colonial wound that is restaged, this trauma that is restaged, that is timelessness, this sense of timelessness, how things being are cyclical and, and are repeated. Um, and uh, the second uh, was dedicated to Oedipus and, um, and to the politics of genocide and violence. Um, uh, it was here for the Berlin Biennale. And the last one the, was dedicated to Antigona. And Antigona is, um, and it was here for the Gorky Theatre. And it was, uh, Antigona speaks exactly, questions this uh, dramaturgy of Narcissus and Oedipus and says, well, I want to bury my brother and I have to challenge the power structures and I decide to challenge these power structures. Um, but what she's also mentioning and bringing is this necessity to uh, make, to do ceremonies and to perform ceremonies and rituals to name our history and to name things properly by their name. And one of the things we've been doing is not to name things by the proper name. And we have this, this colonial wound being repeated where uh, the history is not documented, um, the names are not given, and history appears as a ghost that comes again and again. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I, I, I wanted to... Uh, to create this uh, wide infinity and this wide space mm. as this uh, reverse of power structure, but also to create this kind of timelessness, like we have here, these two mm. backgrounds. It's this, is this a dialogue that it, you create this wide infinity and you don't have a sense, it has something very futuristic. You don't know um, if it's in the past, in the present or in the future. And I think this element of timelessness is a very important element when we are talking about how um, violence becomes cyclical, how in a contemporary day life, patterns of the past become repetitive. Um, and this is exactly this kind of backgrounds that create this, um, this, this futuristic uh, that can place the bodies in any time on 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 any 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 moment in time and place and i find that very very important mm -hmm. do you think that um you would make a, a, a film let's call it a, or a or a project a performative video like narcissus or like Antig or the antigone uh for online would you would you make it differently than in uh, uh, embodied space? Hmm. I I wouldn't do it for online. I I I I like to I like the idea. What I'm really interested on is on telling stories, and then to create and telling these stories with actors, and to create images and movements, choreographies, and texts that tell these stories. And then I really like 
to install them in the way that people come and are present physically. And um, I, I'm, I'm not a filmmaker and I do not intend to be a filmmaker. I think film, you work, you work in a different space. I do like to work with people and to have people present in the room. And I like to explore this idea of the Creole, this, uh, this African tradition of the storyteller who comes, enters a space to tell a story and to revise history and to revise language and to revise images. And that suddenly changes and turns things upside down and reminds us that the things that we thought to know the universal might be a little bit more complex. And this is what the Griot does. We know this Griot tradition um, is an oral tradition. So it's the knowledge production through the oral, through the performance. We have to remember that in most African countries, we produce knowledge. It's not a written knowledge. It has been an oral knowledge. That's why um, this griot becomes so important. It's about the performance of voice, of, of movement, of music. So uh, this needs another presence. I, I, and I like that presence in the room. That's, that's my question. Yes, so you like the presence of viewer, of, of participants, of the, mm -hmm. of the, so, uh, the audience, that's what they were called. So uh, it is like continuing with theater after the invention of cinema, uh, to, to not give up with theater. So to not give up with that, mm. uh, the physical aggregation. I don't know. Because you, you, you feel that the storytelling with a virtual audience would not, it would reach more people, obviously. It would reach more people, yes. Um, but I think in the digital, in the, to screen the work, uh, I would have, because the way I put this work, this very specific work is that you have different, uh, you have a storyteller and you have the actors performing the storyteller at the same time. So there's the presence of different elements at the same time in the, in the room, as well as the audience. So it is created a, a platform of dialogue a platform, there's a dynamic between the work and the audience of, of listening instead of silencing. The, the, the works are very long. It's not a five minutes or 10 minutes work, um, but it takes time. Uh, it takes almost one hour for each storytelling. And I, I like this element of people entering the space and being there. Dedicated, and, committed. And committed and, and staying uh -huh. there and listening. And, and listening to these former extras who are now telling the story. These who become the authors and the authority of their own history and who come to the front and tell the story. I, I, I do like that. They should so go. A... I think it's possible as well. Um, I think it's also possible, but it's also a different dynamic. I think then it becomes closer to film and I don't do film. I'm interested on performance, I'm on, on the writing, on the, on the performance of the voice. So I, I start with the writing, I perform with the voice. I have papers in my hand that I'm, I'm reading while the large projection we are moving and there's a choreography, there's music, there's a pianist, there's a composer playing. Neo Muyanga, uh, who composed from South Africa, who composed the, the music for the... So there's all these different... There's the actors, uh, Moses Leo, Marta Fesiacion, all these actors who come from the theater and are present there and uh, with whom I've worked. There's a, a human presence um, that I find very beautiful to, to, to compose and to stage that in front of the audience. I find that very very empowering possibly they work on digital as well uh, but i think it would be different. but it would be different it would be different very different so what i hear is that the committed audience of a in a place whether it be on in in a museum or in a building or 
or listening to a story under a tree, but it takes a commitment to go there and to be together with others there, uh, not simulated avatars in a virtual reality, because that might be allowing in less committed audiences. Someone who eats a pizza in front of it or is in their pajamas or, 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 uh, or there's a lot of music playing in the room while they're watching your work and it's another music. And so it seems that that is what you find a little bit problematic, that it would be kind of one way, you going into the world in a vulnerable position. I don't know if I would go in a vulnerable position, but I think for me, what I am very busy working with is about, um, I'm working with the topic of trauma and the topic of, of pain. And I think you need to enter these works with a certain respect mm -hmm. and with time. And this is what I try to create in the installations to the audience who might possibly enter those spaces and might by surprise sit for 50 minutes without expecting next to a child and next to an elder person or a younger person or, and that I find very fascinating that it happens. And I think it happens because of that. And sometimes I think many of the people sitting in the audience are sitting in front of seven, 10 black uh, actors for the first time who are revising um, history. And yeah. I find that very powerful. And that the story and the performance of the story with all these different layers of artists are told in a way that people feel it are identified it can identify with the story. And I find that very necessary to create links of identification where people mm -hmm. live in a transformative way, transformed from the installation. So I'm basically busy with this commitment of mm -hmm. creating spaces that create, create a certain peace or certain uh, sometimes I think that uh, it's like each work is like a proper burial where I bring a very unsolved part of my history and I try to bury it properly and, um, and to put things in their place and name it properly with a choreography. And then I leave it there. And... Um, and I, I think that needs the presence of, 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 the, of the audience and mm. the commitment and um, involvement as well. Mm. Otherwise I would do films or something else, I don't know. Mm. Wow, well, much to meditate on. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would like to thank you. I want to thank you too. <laughs> it was wonderful. Well, thank you so much both to Grada and Caroline for this really wonderful conversation and you know how you've tackled some of the complexities, complexities of contemporary digital technologies, highlighting the necessity to problematize you know, their use beyond polarizing dichotomies. Um, Quilomba's work on colonial trauma was a very powerful lens to consider how digitization cannot in itself be separated from the history of colonialism and to discuss the social political emancipation of marginalized communities through digital networks. So thank you once again to Grada and Caroline.